birds or very bird-like animals, uh, and we don't yet understand why did those animals not make it, whereas other things like uh, small birds, lizards, crocodiles, and so forth that were around at the same time did make it. There's a clear filter that big animals didn't make it through the end Cretaceous extinction of dinosaurs and other animals. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the big mystery is not so much why big animals got wiped out, but why some smaller animals made it and others didn't. And that would be a fascinating one to answer. Would it be to do with, um, like, food scarcity and, and you know, in, in times like trying to uh, expand energy to look for food or efficiency, a sort of an efficiency ratio, something like that? Well, big animals tend to be very efficient. That's a, that's a benefit, especially, of, well, in, in general, in, in, for being a, a big animal. You, you tend not to use as much energy or need to put as much energy in to get some energy out of your ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, they're good at conserving heat, for example. They're very well insulated. Uh, so they're efficient in that way, but they need, still need, in absolute terms, a lot of energy. They need a lot of food just to stay alive because they're so big. So um, what they gain in terms of efficiency, they may suffer from in certain environmental conditions in terms of uh, if there is a, a sudden reduction in the amount of resources available, then they're going to be in big trouble because they need a, a minimal amount of resources or else they're, they're dead. And the minimal amount they need is, is still pretty considerable compared to a small animal that can uh, survive off very little at all. So now in 2016, you look around and there's a lot of species that kind of probably wouldn't have been here if humans hadn't interacted. So, for example, since you're in London, um, if you look at a creature like the Queen's corgis, like a corgi, a dog, and, <laughs> and to the naked eye, they don't really appear to be that well put together, you know, in evolutionary terms. Um, what do you think as, you know, the scientist that studies this exact thing when you look at a creature like that, what, what are you thinking? What do, what do I think of a corgi, for <laughs> example, in, in evolutionary terms? Yeah. Or... Well, small dogs, uh, uh, to, t to take the corgi example, um, or any small dog more generally, they've been produced by artificial selection. So they've been, it evolved through a very different pattern than wild organisms do, generally speaking. So they're weird compared to natural organisms. Uh, a corgi probably would have a hard time out in nature and <laughs> either would change very, very quickly or would uh, go extinct if it, uh, if it wasn't well adapted to whatever environment it was, was in. So, yeah, I look at a, something like a corgi and I think that, that is a very weird organism. And, uh, <laughs> Maybe maybe ill suited to, to the natural world, but well suited to our world. Uh, yeah. And of course, it needs us taking care of it. To animals like that, in in order to survive, or or else, uh, yeah, it would either change or go extinct. That's basically your two choices in evolution. If the environment is tough, you've got to change or or go extinct. There's a lot of funny stuff going on, I guess, in the modern world. I, here in Australia and Perth today, we had a 42 degree day celsius and um but people love huskies yeah. here they bring huskies down and and the husky has to get around in 42 yeah. degrees it just seems like the worst uniform to to be wearing it, yeah it's just hilarious oh yeah i'm, I'm sure it's quite hot for them uh yeah <laughs> i wouldn't want to be a husky in australia no. <laughs> um okay so i have a hard enough time myself i'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty big guy myself so i go to australia or out in the heat and uh I don't cope well. I grew up in Wisconsin, which has its warm summers, but uh, goes below zero in the winter. So I'm kind of more a cold weather organism. Yeah, I mean, my hibernation is, is better suited to that. <laughs> Regular hibernation yeah. is, is the key. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, looking at all the species, sort of, and and where they've come from, um, have. You, it sort of holds you in remarkably good stead, also to look forward possibly. Um, have you thought about the current species? What kind of things do you think will be happening in evolutionary terms in the future? Ooh, oh, that's really hard. Predicting the future in, in evolution is, or in general, uh, in science is, is one of the hardest things. But it's, of course, what we often aim to try to do is get better predictions of what might happen 
uh, well, all the rage these days to talk about is, of course, climate change, and uh, that's almost pretty much an inevit inevitability. And so the question lately in conservation biology and other, other fields of biology is often, well, what is going to happen? What organisms are going to make it as the climate generally warms and becomes less predictable, more chaotic over the next 50, 100 years? Uh, and generally, smaller organisms are going to do pretty well. Organisms from warmer environments are going to do pretty well, relatively speaking, on average. Uh, and things like polar bears, of course, uh, to take that example you mentioned earlier, they are having a hard time, and they're going to have an even worse time as uh, conditions continue. Corals, of course, very famous that uh, there's coral bleaching going on because of climate change and pollution and so forth, although corals are pretty adaptable. So if, we're, if we take care of them enough, they, they might uh, do fine. They, they can recover, studies have shown, uh, given enough time to recover. But uh, whereas once extinction happens, of course, that's forever. There's no really turning back the clock on extinction. So um, I do worry a lot about uh, larger animals and more vulnerable species in general, either because they're being overhunted or, or uh, like large-bodied animals that there aren't many of them anyway. So yeah, like rhinoceroses, we may well see the extinction of one or more species of rhinos in our lifetimes, and that would be very sad. Um, I'd love to see what I can do to, to help prevent those kind of problems. So I do work with zoos and other facilities that are trying to do our best to take care of uh, large uh, land animals because uh, they are in deep trouble in general. So that will be one of my predictions is, is that uh, there's going to be a lot of extinction. Uh, and it's a matter of what we do as a, as a society and a species that will determine just how bad that's going to be. There's going to be some. There already is quite a bit of extinction that has happened in the last couple thousand or more years, especially the last couple hundred. It's a matter of uh, controlling that and, and deciding how much can we really tolerate uh, ethically and ecologically as a species. Uh, inevitably, the changes that happen to the natural world are going to affect us uh, in terms of how much food we have as a growing overpopulated world, uh, if we keep wiping out species, there gonna be, there's going to be less for us to, to uh, eat, uh, potentially. And food resources might become more unpredictable. There may be more wars because of that unpredictability, wars over resources like food. So these things affect us, even if we can't see that too easily. As individuals, uh, it, uh, a lot of ecology is very unpredictable, and uh, we may be surprised by how much what happens in the not-so-distant future affects us in potentially disastrous ways, or at least inconvenient ways, or just disturbing ways. I think the extinction of any species that's preventable is, is a very sad thing, and we should be thinking ethically about you know what are we really willing to tolerate there, given that to a certain degree, we are to blame, and we know that. Hmm. Now, you also, so uh, I guess um, as a part of your, uh, just personality, I guess, being very entertaining, that's kind of how I came across your, is in your website, uh, what's in johnsfreezer.com. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's many who loves to, loves to, loves to be having. I try, I try. <laughs> Sorry, say that again? Uh, I, I said I try. I try to be entertaining and <laughs> keep myself entertained, uh, but thank you. And part of your own entertainment, I can tell, is putting up gory pictures on that blog. Yep, yeah, and that's a delicate issue. Yeah, uh, Sorry, was there a further question? I don't want to interrupt you. No, I can't believe it's a delicate issue. I think it's kind of cool. You don't get to so yeah. see the inside of a raptor or what's inside the guts of a yeah. ornithomonopid mid. <laughs> that was really my motivation is that I realized uh, – especially when I was involved with this documentary called Inside Nature's Giants uh, that was filmed, what, seven years ago. I really realized back then and was thinking about it for years afterwards that people don't really get to see what the inside of an animal looks like much, and it's really fascinating in a, in a way. It's beautiful, and it's kind of a shame that that's considered sometimes taboo. Although I think, you know, if you've got a five-year-old kid, they probably don't need to see the insides of animals to a certain degree. 
could, but some people are, are interested in that kind of stuff and can see the beauty in it. And I saw an opportunity there to to serve the, those kind of interests, not in a not in a, um, a nefarious kind of way, not exploiting it in any sort of uh, I don't know pornographic or other way, but really looking at it from a scientist perspective and thinking, you know, this is really wonderful. It's amazing. Look at the the variety of things evolution can produce. We only see the outside of, of that, those varieties. What's going on inside and, and how do things work on the inside? That tells us a lot about animal life. And I have found it very fun to, to share that with people and to see how much interest there really is in that. I think there's a, a still partially untapped uh, interest out there in, in this kind of subject of anatomy. Anatomy is a field that over the last 50 years has often been called, even by other biologists, uh, a dead field that, in which there's like nothing left to learn. But I've seen in my career over the last over the last 20 years, I've really witnessed how this field has, it, if it was ever in trouble, it certainly is not in trouble right now that this field has undergone an explosion. And I want to be part of sharing that to the world, showing how new technologies and new discoveries, like in terms of the fossil record and in terms of animal behavior or other things, are, are showing us uh, just how vibrant the study of anatomy is these days and how little we know about many organisms. Like when I started studying elephants, I looked through the scientific literature on the anatomy of elephants and I realized, oh my God, this is terrible. We know very little about the inside of elephants and what's there, how big are different organs, where are they, what do they compare like to other animals. It was a, a surprising how little there was written on what an elephant was like on the inside. And that actually can be very important. Like if you're trying to cl treat clinical problems with an elephant and you don't know what the inside of an elephant should look like in a normal animal, how are you going to know what's abnormal and how are you going to help elephants in captivity or even in the wild, for example, from a veterinary perspective? How are you going to treat any sort of problems that they have if you don't even know if a, what looks like a problem is a problem or just normal variation? So there's a lot we can do there with anatomy, for example, and anatomy is also the foundation of a lot of other science we do, like computer modeling and biomechanics and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've definitely enjoyed uh, bringing all that work to uh, the public or whoever whoever cares and, and is willing to listen. Still a, still a pretty small niche kind of blog, but uh, <laughs> it's been exciting, even the level of interest I've gotten. It's very entertaining. I mean, you've desensitized me now. If, if it's got a stomach training rating of under five, I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you didn't well, read. yeah, I try to mix it up a bit. I, I don't want to, if I had it at a nine or 10 all the time, I think, uh, I think <laughs> it would be an overkill. And I try to keep some variety there. So the, there's something for people that really want to think more intellectually versus just the crazy visual stuff that blows your mind yeah. a little bit uh, or, or, or even disgusts you a little bit. I try to vary the, um, the stimuli that are presented in that blog and, and keep people on their toes a little bit in terms of what what's coming ne next. Although, yeah, with the stomach churning rating, trying to warn them, warn them if there is something that might upset them coming up. I think it's cr um, criminal that people say that any field in science is a dead field because um, I still teach in schools every now and then and I'm looking at kids, you know, seven, eight years old that are hearing about dinosaurs almost for the first time and each of their mind every year that there's 30 kids' minds blown again and they would just get set on a path just sort of similar way to you did just from the interest, you know, they're getting out all the books from the library and, and reading them all night with a torch, you know, that kind of style. Kids are still doing that. So to say that anything is a, a dead field, um, especially something, you know, related to locomotion and um, evolution would just be, you know, absolute fallacy, I, I think, in my opinion. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, the problem is that uh, scientifically, as we gather more knowledge, inevitably every field does decrease in terms of what's left to discover. As we discover more, if that if those discoveries are accurate, which you know sometimes they're not, uh, and we need to test that. But as we learn more, there's le less to discover. So every field is 
sort of dying in a way as you discover more, but also by discovering more, you open up new questions that you may